Max Math Methods. And um, so we actually finished all the uh, material that we uh, required for, uh, for exam number one, for homework number one today. As I promised, we'll just solve a couple of example problems and uh, that will serve as review for the test. That's on Thursday. And uh, we would also, I would also summarize what to expect from the test and uh, talk about the format of the test towards the end of the class. So I'll, I'll keep it short today to leave it out for questions and answers. Uh, all right. So uh, So uh, let's look at a 2D curvilinear coordinate system example. All right, and uh, in this case, let's say that uh, we are the XY system and we want to transform to a, a system UV that is basically defined by this line, this line, so this is the coordinate U, this is the coordinate V. And uh, this line is y equals to x. This line is y equals to minus x. And let's say that this is a local system. So there's a parallel line here. We'll talk about these when you see the, the next implementation that I'm going to go over. This is a line uh, y equals x minus 1. And this is a line. y equals minus x plus 1. So let's say that we want to calculate the area under these, or the intersection of those four lines. And uh, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a transformation from the xy system to the uv system. Okay, I'm going to just trick. Well, you know what it takes to calculate the area on the four curves, you're going to have to calculate the area, the integral of the, assuming that these are not just straight lines, assuming that these are given by curves, you would have to calculate the integral of this curve uh, from limits of integration to the intersection, then another integral of this curve from this limit of integration to this intersection. So you, you see how many integrals you would need to calculate uh, to visually first interpret these, uh, this uh, uh, interaction of these four curves. Calculate all those integrals so that you can arrive at the area under the curve. Instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform from the XY system to the UV system. So I'm going to rotate this. So at the end of the day, the UV system will look like a simple square. And the area under a square is just base times height. Um, that is going to be more uh, obvious on the next implementation, as I mentioned, where we talk about the implementation of correlating coordinate systems and, for example, finite element methods. How do the finite element construct framework works under the hood uh, from a XY, uh, XYZ system to a, to a system of localized coordinates? All right? Uh, this particular problem has, has very good applications in thermodynamics, for example, where the area under a curve of four processes can mean the network, or it can mean the amount of heat uh, transform or exchange in a process. And those intersections might be actually cumbersome to calculate, and the area under the curve might be cumbersome to calculate because you need to perform all these integrations. In this case, if you can come up with a transformation that allows you to rotate the system, then calculating the, thank you, the area under the curve is just a matter of calculating the area of a square. So for example, you can transform from this system to a system that looks like this. Where 
this is u, this is v. This is zero, this is one. This is zero, this is one. And this will be equivalent to the line y is equal to minus x. This will be equivalent to the line y is equal to minus x plus one. This will be equivalent to the line y is equal to x, and this will be equivalent to the line y is equal to x minus 1. The same thing we wrote on this particular. So then we can take the area of this square right here, that will be 1, times the Jacobian of the transformation, right? So if we take the integral of, over the differential area, the differential area is related to the differential area of the xy system through a Jacobian of the transformation, and that Jacobian is just simply a uh, uh, function of the, of the metric tensor or the, or the uh, uh, scale factor. So here the forward transformation is given by, well, u is equal to x minus y, and v is equal to x plus y. that at v equals 0, at v equals 0, y <coughs> is equal to minus x, and at u equals 0, at u equals, I'm sorry, at u equals 0, the axis u, y is equal to minus x, and at the axis v, at uh, u equals 0, y is equal to x. Right? So, when Using this transformation, you can solve for the for x and y as a function of u and v, and formulate the backward transformation, uh, which transform, and it would be well if you add this two, for example, that would be a way of solving it. Uh, like the example that was on the homework, you had uh, you have the backward transformation, y1, y2, and y3 as a function of x1, x2, and x3, and I ask you to calculate the forward transformation. That would be x1 as a function of y1, y2, and y3. x2 as a function of y1, y2, and y3. So that would entail solving a system of three equations with three unknowns, which you can solve by whatever method you want, substitution, reduction, and so on. In this case, it's a system of two equations of two un of and two unknowns. So we would need x as a function of u and v, and we'll need y as a function of u and v. We can do that whichever way we want to. The simplest thing that you can see from here, or that I can identify from here, is that if I add these two equations, I get u plus v is equal to 2x, and that actually solves for x being equal to 1 half of u plus v. And if I subtract these two equations, I get u minus v, or let's say I subtract the first one from the second one, uh, I get v minus u is equal to 2y. And y would be equal to 1 half of v minus u. And there is the backward transform. All right. So let's say that we're interested in calculating that area. Let's say that I'm interested in the um, area, whatever physical interpretation that area is, is the integral over the area of dx dy. But then I would actually have to impose the limits of integration in the x and the y direction and find the intersection of those curves. And if they were not linear equations, that would be a little bit more difficult. Or I can just do it on the formal linear coordinate system, this one, which will be simply the integral from zero to one times the integral from zero to one times the Jacobian of the transformation times the u dv.
because that would be the Jacobian of the sublimation <coughs> of the area. And notice that this is not surface area. This area is equivalent to a volume because we're talking about 2D coordinate system. Okay? We're not talking about the surface area in 3D coordinate system where you had a transformation between a surface area in one plane and a surface area in another plane. So this surface area transformation is equivalent to a volume transformation. In 3D, so this is in 2D, is equivalent to a volume transformation in 3D because the system is two-dimensional. Okay, so basically this is a volume, a 2D volume. In this case, the Jacobian of the transformation. This is slightly different from what we've seen in generalized coordinate systems, where we use a metric tensor. In this case, this is simply the x du, dx, dv, dy, du, dy, dv. The determinant of that 2D matrix, or 2 by 2 matrix. Such that, let's see, dx, du, derivative of x with respect to u is 1 half, dx, dv, the rate of x with respect to v is 1 half. dy du, the rate of y with respect to u is minus 1 half. And the derivative of y with respect to v is 1 half. So therefore, the Jacobian of the transformation is the determinant, the determinant of 1 half, 1 half, minus 1 half, 1 half, is equal to this one times this one minus this one times this one. One half times one half <laughs> minus minus one half times one half. And that is equal to one half. And the area whatever physical interpretation that has, if these were four processes in a thermodynamic cycle, the area would be the work, the area, in a, and this is a PV diagram, X is the pressure, and Y, I'm sorry, X is the volume, and Y is the pressure, then this will be the work. Or if this would be just a four process in a TS diagram, then there will be, this will be the amount of heat exchanged in the cycle. All right, so this will be the integral from zero to one, Integral from 0 to 1 of 1 half du dv, and therefore the area is just simply 1 half. That would definitely require a lot more steps if we were doing this by just integrating in the xy system. So, well, the same thing happens when we implement curvilinear coordinate systems and final limit methods. So, implementation of generalized curvilinear coordinate systems in finite elements. Element analysis or methods. Method. All right. So let's talk about a 2D example, but this then can extend and apply to 3D the same exact way. In 2D, let's say we have a domain. So 
domain, again, it's omega. And over that domain, we're trying to solve a governing equation, let's say for heat transfer, fluid mechanics, acoustics, vibrations, call it mechanics, whatever it is. But we have these complicated equations, differential equations, and what we want to do is just solve them piece by piece. We know that we can use a computer. If we formulate a method that can take this uh, couple differential equations into a, a sequence of coupled algebraic equations, and, uh, and we do so by basically desolating or polygonalizing the domain. So we take the domain and we break it up in pieces. We break, we triangularize it or, or break it up into quadrilaterals. Whatever it is, we break it up and define with so-called final elements, right? The whole thing needs to be So let's say that we are going to look at this particular element right here. And let's say how we implement, let's, let's talk about the fact that we're using quadrilateral elements. The extension of these to triangular elements is actually simpler. So what's happening is that in the global XY plane, I have a quadrilateral that looks like that. Okay, that's the element E. Let's say we're zooming in into E. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass a coordinate psi, and I'm going to pass a coordinate eta through the middle. And I'm going to define these as node 1, node 2, node 3, Note, note 4, where the coordinates of note 1 are x1, y1, the coordinates of note 2 are x2, y2, the coordinates here x3, y3, and x4, y4. In, additional, in addition to each node having a corresponding allocation, geometric allocation, x, x and y, each, each node is also going to have a field variable associated with it. Whatever field variable we're solving for, if we're solving for temperature, then each node has a temperature 1, temperature 2, temperature 3, temperature 4, associated with each node. Which, with each node. So there is a forward transformation and a backward transformation that will take these Psi and this is eta. Same thing, but this is psi and this is eta. And let's say that uh, in this local coordinate system, the new system looks perfectly square. Okay? So it looks a perfect square. Where note one maps here, note two maps here, note, note three maps here, and note four maps here. And this is minus one, this is one, this is one, and this is minus one. And therefore, the coordinates of note one are minus one, minus one, and the xi eta system, this, the coordinates of this one are one, minus one, the coordinates of note three are one, one, and the coordinates of note four are minus one. So this is a four-noted finite element in 2D is called a bilinear element. With forward transformation X, Psi, and 
theta is equal to summation from i equal 1 to 4, xi and i of psi and eta, and y of psi and eta is equal to the summation from i equal 1 to 4 of yi and i of psi and eta. Okay. And this nomenclature for a transformation, although it looks different than the one we've seen for generalized quantum systems, is the one that is is the one that is uh, commonly employed in all numerical methods because it is actually expressed in terms of these n functions, which are called basis functions. The and i of psi and eta are the bilinear basis functions. These are called basis functions because they must obey following property. Well, the property would be, well, and I evaluated at psi j comma eta j should be equal to one if I is equal to j and zero is i is different than j. Okay? I mean, if you write the whole thing and then we will explain this. So we're looking for functions that provide us with a local transformation. It's called local transformation because each element is going to have its own sort of transformation that will allow us to go from a quadrilateral in space that is oriented and it's not a perfectly, it's, it's not necessarily oriented uh, as a square. It's not perfect. It's not necessarily perfect, uh, perfectly a square. And we want such basis functions so that the transformation allows us to make this a perfect square from minus one to one, from minus one to one, in this i and eta space. Okay? That's a localized transformation. So we need to come up with these functions. And these functions are such that, as you can see, because node one is mapped as x1, y1, node two is x2, y2, and so on and so forth, the, the forward transformation has to be such that the node, the value of x, multiplied times each of its uh, basis functions has to actually has to retrieve the value of x at the corresponding node when psi is equal to minus one and when eta is equal to one to minus one this should actually retrieve x one when psi is equal to one and eta is equal to minus one these should actually retrieve x two okay these basis functions are actually not difficult to find I have the whole derivation of how to find them here but I'm just gonna Write them down for you. These are the bilinear finite element basis functions for bilinear finite elements are n1 psi and eta is equal to one quarter of one minus psi minus eta plus psi eta. N2 of psi and eta is one quarter of one plus psi minus eta minus psi and eta. And three of psi and eta is equal to one quarter of one plus psi plus eta 
loci and eta. And N3, N4, loci and eta. Minus side. So you're going to see these four these four functions are bilinear functions of psi and eta. They're bilinear bilinear polynomials that actually satisfy these particular property. Because if you notice, for example, node number one. Verify this property. And node number one, function one should give me one, and all of the other three functions should give me zero. Right? So node number one, when psi is equal to minus one and eta is equal to minus one, you substitute psi for minus one and eta for minus one. And as you can see, you get one plus one plus one plus one divided by four, that gives you one. And any of the other ones, you substitute psi equal minus one and eta equal one, it cancels out so that you get zero. When psi is equal to minus 1 here, this 1 cancels with these minus 1, and this 1 cancels with these minus 1, and you get 0. And every one of them will end up canceling. Okay? Same thing when you substitute, for example, no 3. No 3, psi is equal to 1, 8 is equal to 1. Basis function number 3 should give you 1, and all the other three basis functions should give you 0. Okay? Let's try it. When psi and eta are both equal to 1, you get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Divided by 4, you get 1. And any of the other ones, you'll have a cancellation. 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, you get 0. 1 plus 1 minus 1 minus 1, you get 0. 1 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1, you get 0. Okay? So these are tricky functions that come very handy, because then you can interpolate any quantity, not only x and y, you can interpolate any field variable. So therefore, therefore, Notice, if we expand this expression right here, x, xi, and eta is equal to x1 times n1. So that would be x1 divided by 4 times 1 minus psi minus eta plus psi eta um, plus x2 divided by 4 times psi 2, which is 1 plus psi minus eta minus psi eta plus x3 divided by 4 times n3, which is 1 plus psi plus eta plus psi eta plus x4 divided by 4, 1 minus psi plus eta minus psi eta. Now we just tested these functions and test them at the different nodes. And we know that if we plug in the value of eta equal minus 1 and theta and, and psi equal minus 1, we plug these values in here, we're going to get x1 out of these. Right? But that only serves an interpolation and a transformation that works in the entire domain. Not only just at the, vertex, at the vertices, not only just at the nodes, if I want to know, well, what would be the transformation of the point psi <coughs> equals 0, eta equals 0, the center point, and I plug into this transformation, psi equals 0 and eta equals 0, I get the value of x. What do you think the value of x will be right here in the middle? It will be kind of a, an average between x1, x2, x3, and x4, right? A bilinear average between the four of them will give you the value of x right here in the middle. All we need to do is plug it in here. Well, if you plug psi equals 0 and eta equals 0 everywhere on this expression, you get exactly the arithmetic average of x1, x2, x3, and x4. Because all these will vanish. You'll get 1 times x1 divided by 4, 1 times x2 divided by 4, 1 times x3 divided by 4, and 1 times x4 divided by 4. Okay? And same thing would, the same thing would apply at any location in here. That would mean that you can actually integrate over these little square, which makes it very easy to integrate on, and then transform that integration into, or back transform that integration, to whatever quantity you're trying to integrate, into this global coordinate system. And that's the basis of finite elements, because the finite element method is a method that, is, that relies on integral equations. 
And in an integral equation, you don't solve the governing equation from the differential point of view, you solve them from the integral point of view. So you're implicitly and explicitly integrating over the entire domain. So instead of integrating over the whole thing, you integrate over each of the finite elements. So you're basically integrating these very simple linear basis functions in a simple square. And all you need is a Jacobian of the transformation to transform that integral in the space to the integral in the space. And then you connect all that, and then you solve for your temperature distribution or whatever it is that you're trying to solve for. So basically, as these basis functions serve to interpolate the geometry to the local coordinate system, that is, let me write it again, x of psi and eta would be just simply the summation from i equal 1 to 4 of xi, which is perfectly defined as a location of note, times each of the bilinear basis functions, y of psi and eta is equal to the summation from i equal 1 to 4, yi, and i of psi and eta. They are used to also interpolate the values of field variables to the local system. That is, for example, if you're solving a heat transfer problem, that would mean that the temperature as a function of psi and eta would be the summation from i equal 1 to 4 of temperature at each node, ni, psi, and eta. Same exact basis functions. You don't need to change the basis functions. They're, all, they're always going to be the same. As long as you define a quadrilateral in space, you can always bring that and map that to a perfect square in the psi eta space. And whatever values are the vertex on the global space will interpolate, will transform to the local space, the values of the vertices on uh, the local space. So at the end of the day, solving, for example, a heat conduction problem is just a matter of not solving for a function. It's the solution of a differential equation or an integral equation as a function. When you use a, a finite element approximation, you're basically solving for nodal values. And you know those nodal values are locally connected through shape functions. Similarly, biquadratic <laughs> basis functions may be derived to transform. global <coughs> curve quadrilaterals as squares or two squares squares in local coordinates. That is Say that in the XY system, and let's say now that we have a Z axis, and 
we have a surface in space. Side. This is a coordinate eta. I'm kind of rotating it, but it really doesn't matter. Actually, this will be side, this will be minus side. Okay? And let's say that this has coordinates x1, y1, z1. This one has coordinates x2, y2, z2. Coordinates x3, y3, z3 and x4, y4, z4. So this will be node 1, 2, 3, 4, but in addition to that, then I'll define node 5, because I want to represent these curved lines, node 6, node 7, and node 8. And each of those have corresponding coordinates, x5, y5, so on and so forth. And then the forward and backward transformation will result in an eight noted element. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And this will be minus 1, minus 1, this will be 1, minus 1, this will be 1, 1, and this will be minus 1, um, 1. And note number 5 will have 0, 1, 0, minus 1. This will be 1 and 0, this will be 0, comma 1. This will be minus one comma zero. <coughs> so Eight noted by cube by quadratic <coughs> finite elements that we can use to represent a curved surface in space to a 2D plane basically result in x of xi and eta equal to the summation from i equal 1 to 8 of xi and i of psi and eta. y of psi and eta is equal to the summation from i equal 1 to 8 of yi and i of psi and eta. <coughs> and z of psi and eta. All of that is happening behind the scenes when you use the software that uses finite element analysis, mesh the domain, it is internally building all these interpolations based on this basis function. And then it needs to solve the equations, which will entail integrating whatever terms as functions of the uh, as functions of the field variable happen to be necessary to integrate satisfy some sort of con conservation. So for, for example, integration of a field variable f of x, y, and c 
in or on this surface S of X, Y, and Z will reduce to. So basically, if you want to integrate, let's say, over the surface S, the function F dS, this will simply be then the integral from minus 1 to 1 of the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f, which is a function of x, which is in place a function of psi and eta, y, which is a function of psi and eta, and z, which is a function of psi and eta, times the Jacobian of the transformation in terms of psi and eta, d psi, d eta. Now there's no guarantee, and it will never happen, that this transformation is ortho orthogonal. Remember, we're taking a curved surface in space, like this one, which can be skewed, it can be slender, it can be tall, and we're transforming it into a perfect square in another plane. So chances are that this system is not orthogonal with respect to the psi eta, to, I'm sorry, with respect to the xy system. Okay? And the fact that is not orthogonal is obvious when you calculate the metric tensor because the Jacobian of the transformation here, the Jacobian of the transformation psi eta involves the square root of the metric tensor or the elements of the metric tensor. Such that these elements of the metric tensor, d psi psi, are equal to dx d psi squared plus dx d psi, I'm sorry, dy d psi squared plus dz d psi squared. So we've done this. g eta eta is equal to dx d eta squared plus dy d eta squared plus d, z, d, eta, square, and g, xi, eta is equal to d, x, d, xi, d, x, d, eta, plus d, y, d, xi, d, y, d, eta, plus d, c, d, xi, times d, z, And those will be functions, each of these derivatives will be functions of these basis functions. So it's that, for instance, the x d psi is equal to, we take the basis function, to say that's equal to dx, <coughs> the summation from a equal 1 to a of x i times d n i of d psi, psi and eta. Same thing, dx d eta, d uh, y d psi, so on and so forth. Those can be easily calculated by taking the derivatives of the basis function. Now in this case, we have the biquadratic basis functions, which is a group of eight functions that are prescribed, very well known. There are different from those four that we calculated previous example, or that we stated in the previous example. All right, so this that I just talked about, this final element implementation is just for informational purposes. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you any of that in the test, so don't worry about it. Um, it's just that a lot of these that happens in, on the background or under the hood of these software packages uh, that you use routinely has a lot to do with coordinate transformation, the calculations of Jacobian's integrations in space, and all of that happens on the fly. Now, years ago, they had the brilliant idea of doing this, 
and especially the fact that this local transformation goes from a global system x, y to a local system phi eta that is always bounded by the same limits minus one to one, which then make, makes it extremely easy to integrate. Whatever you need to integrate in the space, you're in integrating between minus one and one. And it just happens that uh, numerical integration routines, because you don't integrate these by hand, you don't integrate these, these analytically. The computer doesn't do that. The computer uses approximation for the integration, like trapezoidal rule. It's slightly different because it uses something called Gaussian quadrature or Gauss legendary quadrature or Gauss Chebyshev quadrature, which are simply evaluations of the integrand at specific points between minus one and one, and then a weighted summation of that. That's what quadrature rules are. So it actually becomes very easy to integrate anything in a square that goes from minus one to one or in a volume that goes from minus one to one, minus one to one, minus one to one, because this the transformation can also be easily performed in 3D from a hexahedron to a, to a perfect cube, or even from a tetrahedral, okay, a pyramid, to a perfect cube. So these this transformations are very simple, and become, <coughs> they become very use, useful, and then the computer can actually perform these operations routinely on the background and provide results to otherwise very, very complicated problems. Okay, so uh, this is so, kind of the sort of things that I do and the follow-up to this class. Remember this class is math and model. <laughs> talk about the formulation, talk about the framework. And the follow-up to this class in the spring, which is not a required class, so you don't, you don't have to take it, is uh, it's a class on uh, exclusively on modeling. Okay, so we go over formulations of finite elements, finite differencing, finite volumes, boundary element, metrics methods, local and global interpolation processes and, and things of these nature. All right, so um, are there any questions? Yes, sir. The stuff that you were just talking about, would that be when you change your mesh and size? Or yeah, anytime you change the mesh size on, on when, you, when you're working with a software package and you change your mesh, mesh size, the code internally remaps everything. So anytime you change your mesh size, your count of nodes changes. Right? And the, every cell actually has its own uh, connectivity uh, that's associated with a, with a global count for nodes, and a local count is just one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if, it's, if it uses a make node element. Okay. And internally, it uses these, the same basis functions all the time. Obviously, the basis functions in 3D are slightly different, but it uses the same principle, same basis functions, same integration routines. The computer is very dumb. Uh, doing things that are complex, but it's very useful at doing things that are very simple, very fast. So instead of having it calculate some complex things, you actually mathematically simplify the problem for the computer to solve it as a sequence of very, very simple, easy summation problems over and over and over again. Okay? And then each of the nodes in a finite element problem becomes a degree of freedom, an unknown to be solved for. Instead of solving for a global re functional representation of something, like the temperature, for example, the computer is just going to solve, at the end of the day, for the nodal values of the temperature, depending on how many nodes you divide the domain in. All right, so um, are, are there any questions on this? I want to stop right here and, um, and then just basically talk about the exam and maybe answer some questions that you may have about the exam on Thursday. And um, everything after, the exam will, will shift uh, topics, obviously. We'll, we'll, we'll start looking at differential equations. And we'll come back to more linear systems, because then sometimes those differential equations will have to be expressed <coughs> in cylindrical or spherical corner systems for, for obvious reasons. All right. So let me, uh, let me stop the recording, too. Excuse me. <coughs> well, actually. Why, why am I going to stop? Just leave it like that. I can leave it recording. All right. I'm just not going to post this note, but the video will be posted. All right, so exam number one. It would be on Thursday, um, September 
24th, right? Mm -hmm. 2015. At 3.45 p.m. And it would be at uh, LB171, where we're standing right now. Um, the exam will last uh, 75 minutes. So I'll design it to be solved within 75 minutes or less, obviously. Um, it will consist, it will be open books and notes, including my own notes, which I post already on, on Canvas, so you can download those and print them, including the solutions, including homework solutions. Post that those uh, later today, and uh, you can print them out and bring them. But obviously, in 75 minutes, you're not going to have time to review your notes during the exam. So make sure that you you're well versed on, on everything uh, everything that we've covered, so that you just use your notes as reference for any kind of formulation that you want to memorize or anything like that. Um, the exam also allows you to use uh, uh, use uh, uh, computers is allowed. The only thing that I ask for is that the exam is individual. So this is an in-class exam. The next one will be take home because you're going to have to write some programs. Not programs, but just use uh, a mathematical spreadsheet of your choice. MathCAD, Mathematica, Maple, MATLAB. A programming language or Excel, whatever you want to do. Uh, so that one would need to be take home. All right. So uh, this is a format for the exam. Am I missing anything? Oh, there'll be no units, so you don't have to worry about inches or anything like that. The exam is a math exam, so it'll be dimensionless. Um, all right. So the topics. Field theory, all right, that includes uh, gradients, divergences, curl, Laplace, of vector fields, That includes line integration, surface integration, that includes volume integration, there will be a question on Either verifying Gauss's divergence theorem or Stokes' theorem. So you will be asked to calculate both sides of, of, the, of the theorem, the, the two integrals, and verify that you get the same answer. There'll be at least a problem like that. There'll be a problem where you have to calculate gradients and divergences and things like that. And there'll be a problem where you will calculate you know, curvilinear coordinates. So calculating uh, forward and backward transforms, uh, differential arc length surfaces and volumes, and more than likely there will be a question where you are asked to calculate 
the gradient, divergency, curl, and Laplace in an orthogonal system. Remember that the expressions that we formulated in class for the gradient, divergency, curl, and Laplace are only for orthogonal systems. The rest we did in general. We did in general the backward and the forward and backward transformation, like the one in the, in the assignment. It was a non-orthogonal system. Uh, you can calculate differential areas, arc length, surfaces, and volumes for non-orthogonal systems. But the expression that I gave you for gradients, divergency, curls, and Laplace are only for orthogonal systems. So there will be a total of three problems to be solved and let's say I'll, I'll design it, I'll have partially designed it, but I'll design it to be solved within an hour so that you get 15 minutes to at least verify your answer. All right. Now the assignment, those eight questions, the assignments are a good indication of what to expect for the exam, except that obviously it's very, very long problems. But even the problems on the assignment where I ask you to solve a particular integral, I did it two different ways on my solutions. When I post solutions tonight, for example, if I ask you to do a, uh, a volume integral of, some, or of something, then in my solutions I did it as a volume integral and then I also did it as a surface integral using Gauss's divergence theorem. Or if I ask you to do a surface integral, I also did it as a line integral using Stokes theorem. Okay? So I solved it. I didn't ask you to solve it both ways on the assignment, but I did it on my on my um, on my solution, so that you uh, you can use that as a reference. All right. What else? Um, don't panic. Okay. I know that there's uh, some terror stories about this class out there, um, but I, it's all my, and on all my classes. I structure the course very well. I think I, I provide sufficient material for my notes and my solutions and my assignments that I make up myself. And the exam is not going to escape that. It's not going to escape my notes. It's not going to escape my assignments or my solutions. Okay, it's going to be confined to that. That means that, and, and I do sometimes ask challenging questions, but I am very fair when grading. Okay, even though after I terrorized the students last semester with these class, everybody ended up getting A's and B's. Okay, so you do your best, prepare for the exam, and do not panic because there's only negative consequences to that. All right? So, are there any questions? Yes, sir. The last part you said, uh, gradient and divergence, mm -hmm. or bottom, I guess you can say it correctly. On the last class, you, uh, you were orthogonal or no? Orthogonal. I only provided you with expressions for gradients, divergence, and curls, and Laplace for orthogonal system only. Okay? So, if I. If I ask you to calculate uh, gradients and divergence of, of a curvilinear coordinate system vector field, it is going to be on an orthogonal system like cylindrical or spherical or something. Okay? Great. So uh, I'll see you Thursday then. And don't forget about the homework. Eh? Thank you.